Welcome to our Ask the Experts about Gladiolus. I'm Diane Blazik. I'm the Executive Director of National Garden Bureau. I have with me um, Gail Pabst. Gail is doing a lot of our behind the scenes work and she helps us market these events to you. So thanks to that, you guys found out about this webinar and signed up. What I'm going to do is introduce our first panelist and allow him to introduce himself. But before I get started with that, I wanted to give everybody a little tip that if you go to your view on Zoom and click it on speaker view, you're going to have a much better view because um, that way that person's screen will pop up. And if you have any questions, you can start asking your questions in chat right now. If I already have them on the list, I may put them a little bit later during this hour, but feel free to ask your questions and we will try to get to them. So with that, um, I will introduce our first speaker. Brent Heath um, has a wonderful background behind him showing the logo for Brent and Becky's bulbs. So Brent, if you would like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your company. Well, Diane, I'm Brent and I'm delighted to be with you. And I'm, I'm very fortunate. I was born into bulbs. My grandfather started growing daffodils in 1900. My parents did it their lifetime, bought the business in 72 from them, um, married well thereafter, married Becky, not bucks, but brains. <laughs> Becky uh, and didn't, I, I didn't need to be in charge. It became evident pretty quickly. And Becky's enabled me to do what I love doing, and I love gardening, and I love uh, people. So I lecture frequently around the country, but I have been blessed to be a bee in the hands of the Lord. I've bred daffodils, Becky and I together, and we've introduced quite a few new hybrids that are wonderful. So my real expertise is in daffodils, but I love all kinds of gardening. and. Becky names me uh, an orgy gardener because I put everything in bed together. In particular, I like gladiolas because they have every color in the rainbow. There are not many other plant groups that can boast every color in the rainbow. They're relatively inexpensive, but they have a different aspect in the garden. They have a linear aspect where the leaves are sword shaped they're spikes instead of mounds, which most other plants are. So interesting always to have a nice different perspective in your garden. And the glads add that, and they're very easy to install. And they are perennial for us here in Virginia, and zone seven and southward, maybe even zone six. They're temperennial in colder climates, temporary perennials. That means okay. they're perennials somewhere, say, but not in those one. climates, yeah. but yeah. inexpensive enough to be treated as annuals. So we give you license to plant new ones every year. And uh, they, they had a wonderful, and it planted sequentially. So every few weeks, you can have that color all summer long the first year. But um, pretty amazing plants. So I'm blessed that I have a, a son who is viewing me. I'm sitting in his office and he's Zooming me. He now Zooms me all over the country and I enjoy it, so. Excellent, excellent. So we're going to have a co-panelist on in just a minute. We're, we're getting him logged in, but um, you, you already kind of talked a little bit about it, but let's, let's talk a little bit more about gladiolas from a high level. Like um, why are they so popular right now? What, what member of the family? Is there a little bit of history you would like to share with us, Brent, on the history of gladiolas? Well, my perspective is that they are they're members of the iris family. So most iris family members are somewhat critter resistant, not critter proof. They either don't taste good or have a good mouth feel to them. So the critters, if they're hungry enough, may eat them. They are native predominantly to South Africa, but other tropical parts of Africa, somewhat Europe and somewhat Asia. They have been there, I think, 250 species of gladiolus, so wild ones, predominantly in South Africa. 
they have been bred for uh, several hundred years now, um, and they've come up with the the gladiolus. Oh shoot, I had the term written down. Grandiflora types. That's basically what people plant. Either that and or the species types. Most of the glads grow to about three feet in height, the grandiflora types, the florist gladiolas. And again, every color in the rainbow. The species are a little dwarfer in stature, not as many florets, but quite attractive and fitting in gardening situations. They're typically in the one to two foot range. So um, pretty awesome plants. The Latin name gladiolus means little sword, hence the sword-shaped leaves, which after the flowers, you know, we look for flowers in a garden. The flowers are actually the icing on the cake. Uh, they're about 5% of a garden that you see. So important that you look at the cake also and that shape, that lovely linear sword shape is wonderful in the garden. Awesome. Uh, there are thousands of named hybrids. Excellent, so. excellent. Okay, so we're gonna get back to some of those hybrids. And I see that we have our friend from Jung Seeds, Dick Zondag, and he has joined us. So I wanted to introduce him and Jim, Dick, do you wanna say um, a few sentences about you and your company and how it relates to gladiolas? Right, we, uh, we are a 105 year old company started by my grandfather in 1907. Uh, gladiolus is one of the crops that we used to grow about 20 or 25 acres of. Uh, we discontinued that because uh, uh, the equipment was getting old and it would take a large investment to do that. But we've had a lot of experience growing glads. Uh, we mainly grow the, the hybrid colored glads uh, that people think of as glads. And, uh, um, we offer them in our catalog, and so uh, we have had some experience with, with growing glads. Excellent. So between the two of you, there is a very, very long history involved with bulbs and glads specifically. Um, and Dick, you just said something, so I'll ask you to expand on it, and then Brent, uh, you had mentioned it also, about gladiola breeding. Um, could you tell a little bit about you know, what did the glads look like from 100 years ago as compared to what's available today? Um, what is the breeding or the selection work? What are some of the goals on some of these newer gladiola varieties? What are people working towards? So I'll toss that back to you, Dick, and then we'll go to Brent when you're finished. Okay, well, of course, the colors uh, are getting to be more vibrant and uh, uh, they're breeding for, uh, uh, the the uh, colors, of course, uh, to get more ruffles in the in the in the glads. Of course, they, that adds to the beauty of the glads. And uh, you'll have to excuse we have uh, construction going on right behind. That's okay. My we can't hear it that much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, they they're mainly uh, uh, focusing on the colors and and getting bicolors and things like that. Awesome. Okay, Brent, your your input on what people are breeding for or what you're breeding for. And and Diane, I, my breeding is in daffodils. Um, so I don't know much about the breeding of, of gladiolas. We do go to what we consider the best companies for production in the Netherlands. And I think they're breeding for longer lasting blooms, stronger stems, uh, things of that nature. Uh, in daffodils, certainly we're looking for longer lasting blooms, more disease resistance, attractive foliage, um, and fragrance. Now, I haven't noticed any fragrance in gladiolas. Have you, Dick? I, I haven't. No, the glads have very little fragrance. Once in a while, you'll get one that has a little bit of fragrance to it. But um, I think as a whole, the, the gladiolas are not known for fragrance. I, I wonder, I didn't see a question in regards to pollinator, whether they're pollinator friendly or not. And I think perhaps they are because ours do set seeds if we don't deadhead them. Um, and I've seen hummingbirds uh, visiting them. So that's, I think they're pollinator friendly flowers. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say too. I have observed uh, uh, the hummingbirds uh, going after the nectar in the throats of the glads uh, but 
for the most part, I don't think that, and bees, of course, bees are always there looking for, uh, for the honey and stuff. But uh, um, as far as a general pollinator, I, I, I wouldn't consider them that. So we just had a question about fragrance um, because we know this is happening with some of the other crop classes like maybe roses. Um, are the older varieties of gladiolas, you know, like let's just, we'll keep it at a hundred years ago. So let's just think of a hundred years ago, um, were some of the older gladiolas fragrant um, and has breeding taken out some of the scent or is it from day one from earth's beginning did gladiolas just not really have a scent to them is that not part of their characteristics and wish i could answer you in uh perfectly but i do think gladiola tristis uh it's one of the ones that's not quite as hardy often grown inside does have a fragrance i'm pretty certain i remember that and I, but I don't remember ever any of the bigger ones having a fragrance. Um, so it is an important feature added value in Narcissus. The multi-flowered ones typically do have a, a sweeter fragrance. And that's one of my goals that I was breeding for more fragrance. Cause I think it is an additional added value to the flower. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, always... yeah, we, we used to sell a, bulb called fragrant, uh, fragrant blads, but they were ac called accidentras. That was the Latin name of them. Oh, they okay. Really That's gladiolus. right. Gladiolus. Gladiolus calianthus. Yes. Yes. Oh. But, uh, but I think the, the normal glads that, um, that are known for their blooms and things like that, I don't think they've ever had fragrance. Not that I've known of. And, you know, I, uh, glads are a big, memory of mine because I can remember when we were kids and could hardly get through the glad fields. And my mother was very known for taking glad blooms. Uh, uh, we'd go out to the field and cut a whole station wagon full of glads and take them around to the shut-ins and for all the churches in town. And, you know, it's one of the things that I really miss about not having a lot of glads here because we do plant out uh, in fact, last year next to my house, we planted two rows of glads and boy, the, people just really enjoy getting those because they, they're a long lasting uh, cut flower and uh, they just are really a beautiful uh, colors. Okay, so you, you brought up something that I'm gonna wait and put back at the end, but it'll be your tips on cutting them to bring indoors. But let's start with the basics. Let's start with, um, how do you so, and talk to like me as the home gardener? So how do I decide which gladiolas to order and when should I plant them? Um, of course, it's going to depend on your zone, but uh, let's just talk about how do you decide is, you know, is it based on just color or are there other types that maybe you should know before you choose? And then when do you plant them? So. Okay. Well, I end the no okay oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brent. well i think color is your basic choice but also size you do get to choose the species gladiolas which are shorter in stature and i think planting time anytime soil temps are over 50 or 60 degrees is an ideal time for planting we store them at 50 degrees so i think that's also a great time temperature dick I, I agree. 50, 55 degrees is when I, I think about planting them and um, the depth that you plant them, I think uh, probably about four inches. But um, if, you're, if you've got larger bulbs, um, then you want to plant them a little bit deeper because uh, the, the larger the bulb, the larger the stalk and the flower will be. And so if you've got a, a you know, a two inch or two and a half inch uh, gladiolus you want to plant them even deeper because uh, what happens is the uh, nutrients that are stored in the bulb uh, push that leaf uh, that that uh, structure out of the ground and then once it's up above the ground then it takes off on its own and when you dig the glads you'll find the remnants of the old glad on the bottom of the bulb so um, if, if uh, you're planting large bulbs and you only plant them uh, uh, a couple of inches deep, they're going to fall over on you. And that's when you'd really have to stake them. So um, the bigger the bulb, the deeper you plant them. 
Nick, I concur, but I think also even deeper. We recommend um, even six to eight inches deep in sandy soil because it does anchor them better and then they have less t tendency to topple. Right, and the sandy soil is the big thing too. You know, they like a very well-drained soil. It doesn't have to be real fertile, but uh, we fertilize them when we plant them. And then when they are about uh, 10 or 12 inches tall, we'll uh, do another fertilization. But uh, as far as the ground is concerned, you wanna plant them in a, a silt to a, a sandy loam type soil uh, to get the best results. Cause the disease, diseases of glads in heavier soils are pretty prevalent and they like that well-drained soil. So uh, you want to, uh, when we were growing them, we were growing them on a sandy soil and that really did really well. We, we don't use chemical fertilizers, but we do feed our soil consistently with compost and volcanic minerals also add another factor which tend to, it's like building our immunity by vitamins and minerals. I think the volcanic minerals, azomite, uh, gives them that extra resilience to protect them from uh, funguses or bulbs major problems. And when they get stressed, they catch a fungus. So if you keep them good in health and growing, I think that's a, and then the insect is the other, the thrip, uh, we find good air circulation also makes a difference. So. That's good. I, I might come back and ask some more questions on that, but I want to ask about the 55 degrees. Would that be a nighttime temperature of 55, you know, consistently for like a week or soil daytime? temperature? Soil. I agree with the soil. Okay. Soil temperature. I would and it's soil temperature six inches down, not right at the surface. That's soil correct. Temperature. I agree. Six inches down. Okay, I'm glad I asked that one. I would have been planting too soon, so we don't want that. Um, okay, so you talked about that. What about staking? Um, yeah, I, I know that you said they plant them the deeper and you shouldn't need to, but can you stake? Should you stake? Well, one can if, and if one doesn't mind the look of the stakes, I think that's okay, but I don't think you need to. Also, planting them amongst perennials, the perennials can offer some uh, sort of support to the gladiolas. So when the gladiola bulbs are going relatively deep, the perennial roots are relatively shallow, they can be great companion plants in your perennial beds. Agreed. Okay, so you want to give some uh, suggestions for some good perennials to plant them in and among with? I mean, obviously they're full sun, so you don't want to plant them in the hostas under the trees, but... Uh, Indeed. Yeah, any yeah. other suggestions? I would so, say uh, if I were planting them in a perennial bed, I'd want a perennial that isn't in blossom when the glads are in blossom or that, that complements them, uh, something that has a good uh, root structure to it. Uh, with uh, with planting them in your garden, um, you know, planting them deep, uh, it's pretty hard to stake them. So I I, uh, I plant them deep enough and then uh, close enough together that they, uh, you know, they they recommend four to six inches apart. But I plant them in a row where they're kind of supporting each other too. And you know, dahlia is another bulb, sort of tuberous bulb, but dahlias, some of the shorter growing dahlias, like the gallery dahlias. Uh, I often would plant a, a gladiola deep and a dahlia right on top in the same hole. And they coming up through the, dah uh, the dahlia, that helped support them. Um, other perennials that might, I'm looking quickly through the the catalog, even some small shrubs like some of the dwarf buddleias might work well. They have a strong structure and um, would help. The, uh, boy, so you may want to go on. Oh, Eupatorium baby Joe would be a good one. It's the Joe pie weed that goes only to about two feet. So the glad coming up through that would work nicely. So um, there are others. Uh, those Lavender might work. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I like the idea of um, 
where, where I used to work, we had a book called Continuous Bloom. And that's something you aim for, right, in your garden, especially with perennials. So to know, um, so let's talk a little bit about the blooms of your glads. Um, so let's say if you plant them when your soil temperature is 55 degrees, about how much later than that, how many weeks or whatever, will it take for them to bloom? And do you recommend succession planting like you do maybe for some herbs or vegetables? Then I do succession plant every couple of weeks, so I do have flowers throughout the summer. Oh, uh, what I read was that they flower 80 to 90 days after planting. So that's a significant amount of time. And um, so... Yeah, we, we usually planted them in um, mid to late May. Now, this year is a little colder than usual, so we're probably going to be late May. But uh, you probably wouldn't see flowers until uh, uh, probably the first part of the middle of August. And a succession planting, the same thing. You know, if you plant them every two weeks, you're going to have flowers a little bit later. Um, I found that they tend to, to catch up though, you know, they're not going to be two weeks yeah. later than the ones you planted earlier. So, um, but yeah, I, I would say the earliest that you could expect, at least in this area, the earliest that you could expect to have uh, glads blossoming would be probably early to mid August. And then through, you know, some of them are earlier flowering and some of them are later, you know, they tend to, um, it seems to me that the lighter colors tend to be a little earlier than the darker colors. I was going um, to ask that question because I yeah. figured some of the lighter colors might be different. So, and just to clarify, Dick is talking about uh, Wisconsin. So you right. would be planting like yeah. mid May having flowers early August. Now, Brent, you're in Virginia. So how is and, it in your area? And I already have gladiolas up about a foot and a half, but they are from last year's planting. So there are hardy plants here in our climate as long as they sleep in a relatively dry bed when they're dormant. They don't like to stay wet in the wintertime when they're dormant. So almost all bulbs when they're dormant want to sleep in a dry bed. Yeah. Exactly. So, but I have good sandy soil. In Becky's soil in her garden, we don't garden together, um, hers is a heavier soil. And as long as she elevates the so plants in raised beds, Hers are fine for overwintering. Okay. And unfortunately, and so in Wisconsin, in fact, I, um, I, I, I shouldn't admit this, but we didn't we didn't dig any of them last fall because they were leftovers. And I went out to see if I could uh, could get some with uh, with the caramels on the bottom, and unfortunately, they were compost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In our so area. We we have Dick. Are you zone five probably? I would say five, four, five. Four, yeah. five, and yeah. then Brent, are you zone? We're seven? seven, seven B. Okay, so where in that area is the magic to where you're going to have to pull them, dig them up in the fall? Is it zone yep. six maybe where they won't uh -huh. overwinter? Well, research says that they'll go up to zone six, but again, it, I think it has to do with the microclimate, the soil conditions. If your soils stay wet in the winter, I think you're going to lose them. They're going to freeze. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, so many people talk about it's not just your zone. Um, you're right. It's it's the soil makeup and how much moisture it holds will big, be the big determining factor. So to make a blanket statement, we should probably say if you're in zone five or lower, you have to dig them in the fall. Zone six is a maybe. Zone, even if you're in zone seven, you gotta make sure that they drain well over the winter. And Diane, we are frugal, we gardeners, but they're inexpensive enough. You can treat them as annuals, so. This um, is true. I know. But yeah, I'll and Dick go. and I don't mind sending you new ones at all. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, we, we gardeners try to do as much as possible with as little as possible, right? That's right. true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now overall, we're talking about growing, um, you know, on, on, on the scale for super easy to very challenging, where, where are glads in there? Are they on the more easy side to grow? I would say easy, yeah, I, because basically what you do if you've got nice sound bulbs, you plant them and they come up and 
if you're going to keep them year after year in our area, you've got to dig them and, and dry them out and, and store them in a mesh, you know, a, an onion mesh bag. You've got to let them cure for a, a week to 10 days. Uh, when we used to grow glads here, we had a dryer actually that we put the, the glads in a screen bottom flat and we had a, a, a wind dryer that would blow hot air into that chamber and they were in there for two weeks and then you could take them out and uh, we had processed them by taking the, the, the they usually call bulblets, but they're actually caramels, take them off because that would be your source of your stock for the next year. And then the, the bulbs that were big enough were graded and, and, uh, and then uh, sold. So um, it is a little bit of work to keep them, but as far as growing them, they're, they're, they're simple. I agree. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Uh, let's hear somebody had asked, are they, are gladiolus perennial in the South? So I think we've answered that question of yes. pretty much zone seven. And some more so than others. Apparently some of the older cultivars more closely related to some of the species from colder climates are more cold hardy. Okay. Yep. And somebody you know, else. Plant agrees. Delights Nursery has some that are uh, they call perennial glads okay. that are very good. Good, good. Um, and somebody agrees that they're easier um, they're, and they're much easier to overwinter, easier than dahlias. Not that we're dissing dahlias, but we're just saying in comparison, glads yes. are a little bit easier to overwinter. So that's that's excellent. Um, there was another question here. Um, how to treat the cormels or bulblets? So I'm assuming after you dig them up in the fall, yeah. then how do you treat them? You I think Nick just them sort of explained that yeah. by drying is the most important. Yeah. Get them dry quickly and then funguses don't have a chance. We never wash a bulb. We think that's a big mistake. You can tend to bruise the bulb. Now I'm not talking about glads, but daffodils and other bulbs. If you bruise it, then there's a chance for the fungus spores to get in and start rotting. So dry it well and store it dry. And I read it 50 degrees. I don't know, Dick, do you concur with that? Store it yeah, 50 we, degrees? We have a, had a special uh, root cellar that was below ground, but we neither put uh, heat or, uh, if it got too warm, we, we uh, opened the windows and took some cold air in, but about 50 degrees is where they store the best. And as far as the, the storage too, we use it, uh, in, in our operation, we use screen bottom flats. So you could put a couple layers of glads, but there, there was always air circulating around. We had fans running on them all, all uh, winter long to keep the, uh, the, the water away from the bulbs because, well, the corms, you know. Uh, glad is not a bulb, it's actually a corm. It's a piece of stem tissue, not a, not a bulb. But um, we uh, had, uh, air running around them to keep the water from accumulating on the bulbs because like Brent said, you have any free water in there, you're gonna get fungus growing and then the bulbs kind of deteriorate over summer, over winter. Excellent. And what about the bulbs touching? Should you have them a certain space, the, the corms, have them a certain space apart? Will that help with the air circulation like an inch or so? In, in winter or in summer? Um, in winter for storage, we we had them, uh, you know, we had them touching, you know, maybe two or three uh, deep. If you've got air running on them, you put them in an onion mesh bag in the in the basement where there's a little air circulation. You can um, you can have several, you know, a couple of layers of them, and as long as you've got a dry cellar where they're not where they're not exposed to any free water, they're they're fine. Okay, excellent. Um, and then we talked a little bit earlier about planting. So is there any rule of thumb then when you're replanting some of these corms that you've dug up in the fall, probably the same depth the second year, there wouldn't be anything that would change, right? If you grew them a year, they're going to be bigger. So you plant okay. them deeper. So plant them And the deeper. other thing too, that we, um, I don't know if we did it very often, but if we were short on planting stock, you can actually take a large glad bulb and cut it into pieces because it is stem tissue. It's not something that 
you know, like a tuberous root, like a dahlia, uh, you could actually cut it in half or even the big ones, you know, that are like three inches in diameter, you could cut those into four pieces. And because it's a stem tissue, uh, it actually has uh, eyes all, uh, all the way around the bulb and you could plant those and then uh, they would grow uh, into another bulb uh, the following, you know, when you dig them in the fall, they would uh, form another bulb. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so um, it would be like now this time of year, you could divide them and plant them right away. You don't have to let them dry out or anything? No, you want to let them suberize. You want to let them sit out in a warm room for a week to 10 days and then plant them and they, they do very well. They'll uh, in a warm, you know, in a 55 to 65 degree soil, they'll come up right away and away they go. Okay, interesting. Here's another. Oh, that's, oh go ahead, Brent. Did you that scar that? should probably harden off before you put them in the ground, right? Okay. Right. Where you cut them. Yep. Okay. So hardening off and, and then you're good to go. Uh, here's another question. Some tulips in hyacinth have smaller blooms the second year they're in the ground. Does this happen with glads? No, no, I, I think uh, if, um, if you grow them properly <clears throat> and you deadhead them, you know, uh, again, when I was uh, uh, growing up in, in high school, um, we'd go out to the glad field when it was in full bloom. And the only reason that we let them bloom is to make sure that they were the right colors, that they were, you know, there wasn't a red one in the yellow row or a white one in the blue row. And uh, we go out in the morning with, um, um, with uh, butcher knives and um, a beautiful colored field uh, in the morning would be green in the, in the afternoon because we just go through and cut the flowers off because the flowers, once they, uh, um, once they start to fade, if they've been pollinated, they're producing seeds and the seeds will take away from the, the strength that is put into the bulb. So, um, it was always kind of a shame to see all those glads laying on the ground, but uh, for us, we were more interested in the bulbs, so we cut the flowers off. The only reason we let them flower is to to rogue them, so we had a pure uh, pure variety. I understand it. Thirty percent of the plant's energy goes into making seeds instead of going back into the bulb. So we did had all the tulips in Holland as well for the same reason, because they are visited by insects and they do get pollinated. Daffodils, on the other hand, do not get visited by insects in this country, and so we don't dead add them. So um, for the home gardener, they want to enjoy these flowers, but once they droop and start to look a little less beautiful, you do recommend deadheading the gladiolas outdoors yes. then? Okay. Yeah, you cut the stalk right at the bottom where the lowest bloom is because you don't want to take as, you know, you got to preserve as much of the leaves as possible. So you just cut them off right above the lowest uh, blossom. Okay. You know, those leaves are solar. I explained to new gardeners, leaves are solar collectors. They're gathering energy from the sun, carbon dioxide from the air, combining it with the minerals and moisture from the soil. And that's what creates the energy that gets shot back to the bulb, the battery. So that's what most people can understand when you tell it that way. Yeah, good advice. Um, so now let's talk about uh, cutting these stems to bring indoors. So at what stage should you trim them and how should you trim them to bring them indoor to enjoy them as cut flowers? Well, we would when we first see the first color on the first bud. Dick, do you concur with that? Yeah, I would say when you see color on the first two, two uh, uh, flowers, if the, you want them to last a long time, what I do is I uh, I like to get nice stems, and what I do is I just nick the nick the uh, stalk uh, where I want to or uh, where I want to cut it, and then I break the break the stalk, and then you can actually pull that stem right out of the leaves so that you leave as much of the leaves as possible. Hmm. And that way you can have a nice, um, a nice low, tall uh, stem to, to make bouquets with, and yet you're not taking too much of the leaves. Hey. Okay, very good. Um, I forgot to ask this question earlier about mulching. So once you plant these, do you recommend mulching? I know we talked about interplanting them with perennials, 
Um, does it need, uh, you know, that moisture kept in that a mulch will do? I was kind of hearing that maybe moisture is not a gladiola's friend. Um, mulching to me uh, would keep the weeds down and keep the moisture in if you're in a sandy soil because the sandy soils are very well drained anyway and the mulch helps but you want to mulch after the soil is warm you don't want to mulch a cold soil because a mulch tends to keep uh, the ground the way it is a mulch is kind of like insulation and so you want to wait until the soil is nice and warm and then you can mulch and that keeps the weeds and stuff down and i agree okay so again they're pretty easy to grow um, we have a very specific question here that came in, um, and I'm afraid I do not have good news for this, um, this attendee. She says, I live in zone five and have had all my glads slowly die out after planting 60 or more. Other than digging them up every fall, what methods can I use to protect them? And I'm sorry to say, if you're in zone five, yeah, they're they're toast. Yeah, they're toast. If you could keep the soil from freezing, planting them next to the foundation of your house on the south side, with your foundation kept the soil from freezing, that might be a possibility. But I think the only one. Yeah, I think so. She's going to have to start treating them as annuals, I believe. Okay. Uh, let's see here. There was another question, kind of similar. Um, so the the pest and diseases. So you've talked about the fungal diseases, and I think I heard somebody say thrips, um, and somebody commented that all one hundred of hers had thrips so bad they destroyed the blooms. Yeah. So uh, how can we prevent thrips from attacking our glads? Yeah. The way to tell if you have thrip is you take one of the blossoms off the off the stalk and you peel the outer petals away and you look down into the interior of the, the uh, blossom and if you see little things running around in there you've got thrip. Uh, if you get thrip it's it's uh, and you don't treat it you're going to be in trouble because those thrip are pretty they're sucking insects and they suck the life right out of the bulbs. Uh, the only uh, the only thing that I could find, and I did a little research, the only thing that I could find that would uh, a pesticide that would work is imidacopa. We hmm. do uh, have that in our uh, catalog as uh, um, it's a great. There's a granular uh, um, in systemic insecticide, and uh, we have it both in a spray and in a in a uh, uh, granular that you can put right in the furrow with uh, when you plant the bulbs. Uh, but if, if you've got thrip and, and you want to do things organically, I uh, probably going to have to throw those bulbs away, even if you dig them up. We do. We don't use any chemicals, but we do use safer soap and we do use horticultural oil. If you catch it early enough, I think that can be right. a potential um, help to thwart the thrips yeah. and soapy water dish soapy detergent water the spiracles on these little insects they breathe through spiracles on their bodies and if you clog them you're gonna kill them yeah. so so that would be uh, uh it, but you got to catch them early before the you know the leaves start to uh, get those spots on them and and you know, if, if you think you've got them, just do that. To take one of the blossoms and, and open it up so that you get to the base of the blossom and you'll see if you have them or not. We found the only time we were getting thrips was when we, we grow every bulb we sell on a pot and we grow every bulb we sell in the garden just to trial them to see what we're sending our customers. We found the bulbs in pots in close proximity were a lot more prone to thrips than bulbs planted in the garden spaced apart. They had a good air circulation. They didn't tend to get thrips. That's very interesting. Yeah. It's amazing what good air circulation will do. We've, we've mentioned that several times already. Yeah. Um, so we have um, our friends from Mississippi State University South Branch Experiment Center on as, um, as viewers. We work with them with our AAS trials, and I'm just noticing he has put some uh, links 
if you're wanting to use your glads as cut flowers there's there's two very interesting pdfs and anthony if it's okay with you we might use these pdfs on our website could we link to them that would be awesome um but why don't we talk about that um i i did some researching a couple months ago on instagram and saw a lot of really cool ways to use cut glads um, so maybe if you guys want to give a few tips either on um, using them in cut flower vases or some interesting uses you've seen from some of your customers, I bet you have some fun things to share. Well, one of the things that I know about glads is, you know, you, you, when, you, when you get dressed in the morning, you want to dress uh, so that you look good. I've never seen a, a mixture of glads in a vase that have looked out of sorts. You know, you can... The green ones go really well with uh, all the colors and boy, the white ones just are bleach white. And, um, you know, with a lot of flowers, I like to plant just one color, but with glads, um, the mixed colors are just fantastic. And for uh, cut flower arrangements by themselves, or you can use them with other flowers, they just seem to blend in perfectly. So um you know it kind of with with me it kind of depends what flowers are in bloom that 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 are my favorites but boy if you had me pick one flower um that's that's very utilitarian and 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 just out of sight as far as colors concerned glads would be that that flower they are a kaleidoscope flower color and also their their stature is so great because they are tall and they're linear so they fit so nicely at the back of a mass arrangement and again i agree with dick every color in the rainbow so you have your backdrop with linear glads you have your forefront with uh, rounder flowers and as you tear on down you can have and gladiolas you see in funeral arrangements all the time and hence the nickname funeral flowers for gladiolas as they are long lasting in bloom but also that beautiful color but do mix them in with all of your other flowers they can be wonderful uh living uh living art yeah definitely the structure the height there that they work well with other things i love what you said about the rainbow of colors um, we, you know, obviously the reason we're having this webinar is because we've named 2022 as the year of the gladiolus for right. our bulb slash corn crop. And when we were having the artist do the logo, it was like, oh my goodness, which colors did we, do we choose in the logo? It was hard to narrow it down. So I think she put oh. in a yellow, a pink and kind of a, a dark salmon-y color. I mean, in our logo, a white wouldn't work, but oh my gosh, white gladiolas are gorgeous. They go and, with every other color. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Um, and they're very and, tropical. Oh, go ahead, Brent. And Diane, we do something called living flower arrangements where we layer five layers of bulbs in a pot with a color theme, red, white, and blue, pink, white, and purple, yellow, red, and orange are all white. And gladiolas need a big pot. So, but we start with the lily as the centerpiece, the tallest thing, and then a circle of gladiolas and you plant odd numbers in the pot. Um, in round pots, and then the next may be a dahlia, a zantedesia, and oxalis around the outside rim, the shortest thing. So you can create a living flower arrangement also using glads. That's that's a nice idea. We didn't even really talk about growing them in containers. Um, so, like, what size container? Because they're going to get tall, and you don't want them to spill over. We use a we have a use a twelve inch pot, uh, twelve inches tall, twelve inches wide. Uh, and we use dwarf glads in that. We use a 14 inch pot for the bigger glads and bigger lilies as the centerpiece. So that's excellent. Hey, Brent, we're going to have somebody from your company send us some pictures of those because on oh, the good. NGB website, we have a whole um, tab, a whole page about combination ideas. Oh, and good. we would love to feature well, that. But there. somebody would be either Becky or Jay. I don't yeah, do yeah, the yeah. computer. Yeah. I'm the dinosaur <laughs> in the group. Yeah, I, I just do plants and that. people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Dick, do you have uh, some cool growing um, tips or combinations of maybe things to put together or unique ways you've seen gladiolas displayed? 
Yeah, I, I think with what uh, what Brent was saying, you know, you want to pick different size things, you know, so maybe something that's taller in the background and then the glass. And he, he mentioned the dwarf glass. They're really, um, they're more for, uh, um, for display than for cut flowers. You probably aren't going to use those much in a, in a cut flower arrangement unless you're using them in the foreground. But uh, yeah, um, with dahlias too, they they make you know uh, a real splash of color. So I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen because we have a lot of gorgeous gladiola pictures on our website. So I thought by showing some of these pictures, now these are mainly close-ups of the flower colors, but it might just inspire the two of you. You have so much experience. So I thought uh, maybe you would want to chat a little bit about some of the things that I'm showing on my screen. So the first thing that came up was our logo because it is the year of the gladiola. So I wanted to show that. So I'll just go through these. And if you guys want to um, make some comments on anything, feel free to talk about some of these varieties or um, uh, the colors that you're seeing, et cetera. Pretty smashing. <laughs> yeah, they are. And, Aren't they though? Uh, the ones that have the tongues um, are, are quite popular actually. Um, you know, we sell them in mixed uh, in mixed colors, and then we sell the individual varieties. And um, the red glads uh, tend to be one of our better sellers. But uh, of course, white and green also do very very well. But the the ones that have the tongues, like this particular variety, that has the yellow um, the yellow uh, center and the and the orange around the outside, are, are spectacular when they're in the in the garden. They are gorgeous. Here's a bunch of them in a vase. And cool colors there. You see cool colors grouped together, you know, kind of talk to each other. They make a, an interesting, calm, cool statement. Absolutely. So you can have the, the whole cool colors going on, or you can have the warmer colors of summer that would almost look like a sunset. And oh, look at those, how deep those yeah. are. I bet those are red. So those would probably bloom a little bit later in the summer since they're a deeper color from what I heard you saying. Right, and if you're using an, uh, a bouquet for a special event, then you wanna let the, the more of the florets come. And actually you can peel some of the spent flowers off the bottom if they're, uh, you know, if they're past uh, prime and use the ones that are at the top. Oh, that's a very good tip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah these and are gorgeous. You can you can do a patriotic gladiola with red, white, and blue. You know, not many flowers all one kind can you do that with. Right. So that looks like one of the smaller primulinus types. Yeah, that, that we just uh, saw. That one, yes, exactly. Yeah. And I like them. I think they're lovely in a garden situation. They sort of seem to fit a little better than some of the bigger ones. Yeah, they, they're a little bit airier, you know, the others are yes. more flamboyant. Um, so for those and, of us who don't like flamboyant, they might want the uh, smaller ones like this. And these have been very perennial for us. Excellent. Um, another question that just popped up as I was going through here. Um, how often would you trim the bottom of the stem if you're if you have them as cut flowers? That Should particular you re picture is the the glass that I had outside of my house, and I think that's Travis's daughter. Oh and my dog. gosh, that's adorable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's out there picking a a, a bouquet of glads, and uh, in a, we planted them on the edge of our daylily field. Excellent. Um, so back to my question: um, Should you trim the bottom of the stem when you've got them in a vase, the cut flowers? Well, I think that it does tend to harden off. The xylem and phloem tend to harden off, so you trim a little bit off, uh, particularly if you take a few of the spent flowers off, pull it out and cut a little off the bottom of the stem, put it back. I'd change the water also. Um, I even, I don't know, do floral preservatives help gladiolas? They don't daffodils, but uh, they may help. They have some antifungal properties and they have some sugars in them often. Great which will extend the life. 
sometimes I've heard Seven Up or one of the clear um, sodas. You use Sprite. <laughs> have the, yeah, Sprite. Have yeah. The, the sugar that the, the plant needs, uh, so that would lengthen the, the the stability of the flowers in a vase. So yeah, but glads are really they last a long, long time in, in as cut flowers. They're just you know really all around. A great value when consider the cost and then how long they do last. It's a tremendous good value. Yes, yes. But just think of all the smiles they create. That's why we're growing them. They help people to smile. And we all need as many smiles as we can get these days, right? And oh, we these, can each reach out gorgeous. to people who need a smile. Another primulinus type, one of the smaller ones. We like them. Yeah. We even have a flower ministry from our church where people come. I pick the flowers. They come and arrange them and take them to shut-ins or ill people or bereaved people. So, yeah. Yeah, these are some gorgeous ones. Back to primulinus. Primul I love those little ones. Yeah, yeah. I, so I have know. some called Morella that have been coming back for, oh, 20 years in my garden. So this type, how tall would they get as compared to the more about traditional? Two feet, typically 18 okay. inches to two feet. And then the taller ones will get up to three? Three and sometimes even four feet. Okay. Yep. I use a lot of compost and everything grows well in my compost soil. Compost is dirt cheap and... You feed the biome of the soil and everything grows well. Yeah. And if you start with a bigger bulb, you get a much taller bloom too. Oh, you know, that was, sorry, that was something in the very beginning that um, I wanted to ask and I totally forgot. I know a lot of bulbs are graded by bulb size and are gladiola corms done the same way? Like when you buy them, will you know what size corm they are? Uh, yes. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're graded by numbers and, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the smaller, the number, the, the bigger, the bulb is. And so, uh, um, most of the bulbs that we sell are, you know, about this size and they're, um, this I think is a number three and that will give you a nice size bloom. <laughs> We sell ours by centimeters in circumference. So it's the size around and most gladiolas are 14 centimeters and up. So not quite, maybe the size of a golf ball. Okay, that's good. So that's another thing. So number one is the largest size you can get and maybe golf ball or a little larger is the typical size of a, a gladiola bulb. That, that's what of the big ones they are about 14 centimeters the smaller ones tend to be 10 to 12 centimeters okay smaller types good information so we're honing in on the end of our hour and so i started challenging some of our panelists on some other webinars we've been doing to maybe um, close out our session with either just one of your best tips that you haven't already um, given or talk about maybe your favorite varieties. What's your favorite color? And, and then that can be your concluding thoughts for our webinar and things that you um, are sharing with our attendees. For, uh, for our um... For our particular customers, which are mostly in the north, um, I think the little extra effort that you have to put into saving the bulbs from year to year will, will give you uh, spectacular flowers in, in the coming years. You know, the, the, like I said, the bigger the size bulb, the, the, uh, the, the, the more florets you get on the stem, the taller it gets. Um, and, they're really not that hard to do. What I, what I tell them to do is to just dig them, uh, clean as much of the soil off as possible, let them sit out in the sunlight for a couple of weeks so that they harden off a little bit and make sure you cut the bulb off right at the top of the uh, bulb and then put them in an onion mesh bag where you can store them at uh, 50 to 50 degrees or, or a little above that in an onion mesh bag where you get good uh, 
airflow and, and you'll have um, bulbs for years and years, many years. I like that. So the longer you grow them and harvest them, they'll just keep getting bigger and you can have basically like your own little heirloom gladiolas if you go Great. to the work. Yeah. Excellent. You, and Brent? You asked about favorites and Dan, I do have several. The primulinus I mentioned before, these are among the more dwarf gladiolas, 12 to 18 inches. But they, I'm not sure, but I even think they rebloom in my garden uh, when we deadhead them. I could be wrong about that, but they bloom over a long period of time and they fit right in. Another primulinus type called Las Vegas is a sort of orangey red with a yellow center, which has been a great one for us. We do a mixture of them. Um, mixtures are fine, but if you're going to do planting for a focal impact, don't do a mixture. They the too many colors together weakens the focal impact, I think. For for cut flowers, mixtures are wonderful, but if you want to make somebody really stop and look, you know, plant one cultivar, two cultivars blended together, like a yellow and orange together across the front of your property, would have a 55 mile an hour impact. That's what we say, that yellow and orange are two of the most highly focal colors. So you want to get people's attention and just think, every car that goes by is going to smile when they see those. So you'll positively impact your community. And then, of course, plant enough to share. You know, one of my most fun things to do is walk through my garden. I do a lot of garden tours. Um, and then pick flowers for people as we're going, touching them, uh, smelling. Well, they don't smell. The gladiolas don't have a fragrance, except for gladiolas called um, gladiolus calianthus. Uh, used to be called acidanthera murelii. The peacock gladiola does have a fragrance. It's not as big and showy and doesn't have as many flowers, but it is lovely. So sharing yours with other people. These are inexpensive enough. You can plant a whole herd of them. They're not difficult to plant. I use an auger on a, on a drill, on a battery drill, and um, I dig the hole and my partner, gardening partner, whether it's Becky, sometimes I help Becky, sometimes she helps me, but sometimes she gives me one of the teammates to come, and they drop the bulbs in. We can plant hundreds and hundreds of gladiolas in an hour just my my digging the holes and they're filling it in or dropping the bulb and you do want to put it they don't have a real pointy end but they do you can see where the sprout is and the concave bottom that goes down so and jay's motioning time to me so that means i better better <laughs> well, stop talking so okay. much i like I'm to glad talk. you brought that up brent because i don't know maybe 10 or 15 years ago i bought one of those augers so that i could plant all of my bulbs oh my gosh i mean much to my husband's chagrin i'm buying so many more bulbs now that they're easier to plant <laughs> so i think we all have to agree that making them easier to plant means you'll plant more so, so that's that's awesome and I don't know about anybody else, but I am literally going to go buy some gladiolus now. You guys have inspired me. I want this vibrancy. I want the color. I want the stems, the tall stems in my front yard so that when people uh, are walking good. by, they'll be like, yeah, look at those. So good. Okay. our motto is plant bulbs and harvest smiles. I think we'll be doing that. So that is that is wonderful. So Brent and Dick, thank you so much for your expertise and all of your ideas. And I mean, what else do we say other than let's go garden? Let's let's yeah. go plant some more gladiolas. Thank you, Diane. Thank, thank you, you very, Diane. very much. And nice to see you, Dick. Yep, see you, Brent. Have a wonderful day, everybody.